In the name of our God, who is indeed our strength, who indeed, whose boundless mercy he provides, and trust enduring, faith shall prove. Christ is indeed our life, and Christ our love. My brothers and sisters in Christ, that grace and mercy and peace from our God and Father be with you in Jesus. Amen. I don't know why it seems this way, but in America we seem to have this extreme fascination with strength. Whether it's as little toddlers, you see them flexing their muscles, trying to show how big their muscles are, those one, two-year-olds that are always so excited to show their muscles to everybody, and or maybe you look at that second grader who just loves to arm wrestle. That's the thing that they just take so much joy in. And you got to win the arm wrestle because then you're the strongest. As we grow up, you know, you kind of see it in the teenage mentality. They think they're invincible and can do all these things. They're um, smart enough not to get into trouble. And if they do, they're certainly smart enough to get out of it. Or at least they think that. You see it as they're driving fast down the road or whether they think they'll never get caught in all those things that we try to do as teenagers. As adults, we begin to kind of outgrow this invincible mentality, but we still trust in our strength in, in more subtle ways. We don't always ask for help when we're struggling. We try to shoulder it ourselves. We put on that brave, strong face and are reluctant to, to share our problems, our burdens we realize how vulnerable, how weak we are in that moment, and we're afraid to let other people see it. We just think, if I keep trying harder, everything will work out. I can do it. I can get through this myself. And as we even enter into the other stages of life, we start to gain even more wisdom. God teaches us as we go. But then always a new struggle comes up. We start to feel that our minds and bodies don't work maybe quite as well as they used to in those days of our former strength. We start to realize that even in bodily weakness, we don't like that because then we have to rely on others instead of allowing them to take care of us. We want to be the strong one who takes care. And we don't realize that even in our weakness, whether physically, mentally, whatever, we're allowing other people care for us. None of us ever want to be weak in any way. I don't know if you remember those AT&T commercials that were out for a long time. You saw them on TV where the guy sits down with the little kids, kind of looks like a kindergarten classroom or something, and he asks them questions like, would you rather be faster or slower? Would you rather be bigger or smaller? And usually the response is always the same in those kids' terms. They give some sort of crazy response like, bigger is always better. What's the biggest thing you can think of? Infinity times infinity. And in the end, it's always bigger, stronger, faster, better. That's what we desire. That's what we focus on. Especially what we value as Americans. And that's not just in our cell phone providers. We always have to be the best, the fastest, the strongest. We never want to be average, slow, or worst of all, weak. In our text today, Paul is actually speaking against the desire to be the biggest, the best, the strongest. You see, at this time in Paul's ministry, there were some people in the church at Corinth who were known as super apostles, and they were discrediting Paul's ministry and teaching because they were saying that he was somehow less than they were. These men were strong speakers. They had a big presence. They were the biggest, the strongest. They would hold up their accomplished, even their Israelite background against Paul, boasting in their strength and saying, Paul, he's weak. Don't listen to him. It would be like having the pastor who comes to a new church who says, I went to the best seminary, got the best education, can speak better than any other pastor in the world, so you better listen to me. Forget about that other guy. So Paul, in order to reground that congregation at Corinth that was so divided by these super apostles and the truth of God that he had passed on to them from Jesus himself, Paul, too, sarcastically shows 
that he has a good reason to boast as a human, but he goes on to actually say that that boasting actually accomplishes nothing. The only thing that Paul says he will boast in is his weaknesses. Why? Well, because Paul has not only seen and suffered the effects of sin, those things we would hear about in chapter 11, just before our reading, but he has also had those amazing glimpses of greatness, including the great vision, which we heard about in our text, how Paul says he was caught up to that third heaven, he got that glimpse of paradise. He says, just like every other human being, such great things could have given him a cause to become conceited and proud in the accomplishments of his strength. Knowing this, he says, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Just what his thorn in the flesh was, we don't really know. Some people have spent a lot of time speculating. But since Paul doesn't give us the details, he obviously didn't think it was too important for us to know specifically what it was. Its purpose, though, he made very clear to keep him from becoming conceited so he would rely on Jesus' strength and not his own. Paul pleads with the Lord three times in fervent prayer to take whatever this struggle was away. Pay close attention to this. What does the Lord say to Paul? He says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. How could you get an answer like that from God when you, and be okay with that? It's a struggle. When we're dealing with our own thorns in the flesh, we certainly don't want to hear, be content in your weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. Maybe you have a kid or a grandkid at home who's acting up and you're at your wit's ends and don't know what to do. Maybe you're dealing with some health issue that keeps you from doing all the things that you want to do. Maybe you're feeling angry about our country and all the situations that have gone on. Whatever the case may be, whatever the thorn in our flesh may be, how would you like to get an answer from God when you pray three times, Lord, take this sickness, take this struggle away from me, to get an answer like, my grace is sufficient. We want the problem to be solved. We want to say, for God to tell us, just keep plugging away. It'll get better. I, I've got this. You've got this. As Christians, we know that that answer from God, my grace is sufficient for you, is truly the best answer because it's God's answer. But that human nature still wants and hopes for more. We want to overcome. We want to be the strong ones. We want to figure it out because then we can have that sense of accomplishment, that sense of mastery over our struggles. We want relief from the painful thorn. But instead, God says, my child, this thorn is something that Satan may have intended for evil, but I will use it for your good. This will help you to rely on me, to trust in my grace, and I promise you, that grace will be enough. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I am here to remind you this day that indeed God's grace is enough. The challenge is that we sometimes don't even realize how sneaky this temptation to rely on our own strength, to be the biggest, the best, and the strongest actually is. It slides into our lives in ways we don't expect. We may see the obvious thing. But we don't always re realize the subtle ways. It's actually kind of embarrassing for me to admit this, but um, it truly reflects my point in how in big and small ways we rely on our strength and power. Even last night I was having Krista read over the sermon because I wasn't exactly happy with how it was coming together. So I said, dear, can you read this over? So she read it over and she said, you know, I thought it was good. I, and she couldn't understand why I wasn't happy with it. 
I said, I was just hoping to do something a little more with it. Her response, isn't that the point of your sermon? <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh. I'm writing a sermon and I fall prey to this very same thing. The temptation to go beyond God's strength, to go beyond the power of his word, to rely upon my strength, my thoughts, my power to convey this sort of truth of God in some way spectacular beyond what God says. I was seeking my power and not God's. I couldn't help but laugh at the irony of the situation. And thanks be to God, though, he gave me someone who let me see my sin, who let me see my desire to be powerful, to be strong, instead of trusting in God for his strength. And I hope that is just a small illustration of the ways that this temptation can slide into our lives comes maybe in big ways, outward pride, and small ways of not being satisfied with God's doing. But in His mercy, God can take even those tough and bad situations in our lives for His good purposes, even the little things, to, in the words of Paul, keep us from becoming conceited in our strength. These struggles, the trials of life, will empty us of the illusion that we have any strength on our own. All our strength, all our power comes from God. He upholds us. He sustains us. The grace that he has shown us in Christ is more than sufficient for all of our needs. I find it kind of funny how God's greatest display of strength actually is shown in what we would so often consider weakness. Jesus, the most powerful Lord of all creation, empties himself of his heavenly strength, of his power and glory to walk among weak people like ourselves. As he hung on the cross, the greatest symbol of weakness and shame, he died for the death that you and I deserve, for our pride, for our desire to be the biggest, the best, and the strongest. And there on that cross, in his seeming weakness, he showed true strength, ultimately rising again three days Later, in defeating, through what looked like weakness, sin, death, and the power of the devil over all of our lives. That is true strength. This is God's strength and His grace for you, forgiveness and life in Jesus. His grace is more than enough. So it is that we can begin to find ourselves being content when we deal with our own struggles, our thorns in the flesh. Just as Paul says at the end of our text, he says, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, I am strong. My brothers and sisters, in Jesus you are strong. It is not your strength, but his. And unlike our strength, his strength will never fail. I want to close with a simple reminder of God's sufficient grace. And this reminder actually comes in the form of a song. It's a rather fitting because it's usually viewed as a children's song, but the truths are for all of us. At some point in our lives, we probably all sang the song, Jesus Loves Me. You know how it goes, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. That next line may be a line we gloss over, but it speaks that same truth to us. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. My brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters in Christ, when we're going through the trials of life and we're dealing with those thorns in the flesh, Remember that that is God emptying you of your strength so that he can fill you with his. His grace is sufficient for you, for his power is made perfect even in your weakness. When I am weak, then he is strong. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may that peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.